Can you bring it here? Can you bring the camera near? Zoom me on the tripod or something. Can you bring the camera near? Tripod, tripod. Maximum. Ah. Don't you? Ah. So, this should not be seen. Come on. That should not be seen. That's six foot. Huh? Six foot. I know. Oh, now, go, go zoom, zoom. Only till my hand. Only till my hand. Come on, zoom. Come on, zoom. Zoom, please. Zoom, please. Let's get up Can, can you see me clearly? We can't hear one second. Just one second, sir. We can, uh, we can hear you one second. Just one second. You're not able to hear. Yeah. Uh, hello, audio. Well, yeah. Manuel, sir, audio is muted. Uh, sir, your audio is muted. Can you unmute your audio, please? Can you unmute your audio? Yeah, I'm unmuting. Is yeah. it okay? Uh, yeah, yeah, now it's perfect. Now it's perfect. I know it's perfect. Is there a lot of echo from my side? No, no, no. It's very clear. Very clear. Very clear. And uh, can you hear me also clearly? How is your internet connection? I can sir? hear you very clear. How is your internet connection? My connection is good. Connection my connection also. Okay. My connection is good. I will I will show you. My connection, I am having a decent connection. One second, I will show you. Can you see me? Can you see me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, looks good. Hello? There's a little. See, I'm getting 50 years here. Yeah, yeah, this looks good. But the thing is, uh, I don't know why the voice is slightly breaking. Your voice is slightly breaking. That's not a stable, uh, stable in the mixer. Uh, that that, that is not a stable. It's just okay, a sometimes some. Uh, uh, it's not stable. Uh, it's not stable. It's not stable. It's not Oh, that's a good thing. Oh, okay, but how is this video play? Can you move on? Sir, uh, your, uh, the people, IT people here are telling that your connection may not be very stable. That's why your voice is uh, breaking. Can you please play a video? Just just a trial video. Can you share your screen? I told you, no, I, my connection is just showing me. Hello? How much upload are you to download? So, if you have any other uh, Hello. your Wi Fi, disconnect all of them except for your computer. Say what computer? It's not only one computer. 
ஆஸ்திரேலியா <laughs> So he is uh, he's got a very long uh, biodata so I'm going to cut it short because uh, basically Dr Manoj I know him as a person he he wants to uh, his work to talk rather than uh, we talking about him he wants his work to talk and you will see why uh, we chose him as a legend you will see during the lecture how he does it uh, to me uh, on a personal note he's one of the best stapy surgeons I've ever uh, come across in the world I have been traveling around the world but I have he is one of the best so um we are going to um, know all about stapy surgery today and uh, ladies and gentlemen you can ask your questions through facebook live or we have given the uh, website on which you can uh, uh, you can actually uh, see us and you can ask your questions and we will sometimes stop dr manoj to ask these questions and he will he is uh, very uh, happy to answer the questions before we start the program i also want to announce a few more uh, programs which we have already fixed with alambic you know alambic is always meant for academics there is nothing more than academics with alambic and royal pearl so we're going to do a program on 5th of january that is 2019 the first program and we dedicate this program to professor heinz stamberger so i just want to uh, convey my deep uh, you know uh sorrow from my heart bottom of my heart because we heard that prof stamberger is no more with us and actually this program also is dedicated to that great gentleman even though he is a rhinologist and this is an oncology topic but whatever uh, we do today will be actually dedicated to prof stamberger actually uh, and uh, we are doing a program on fifth just on prof stamberger and we'll do one program on 19th january mark your date with professor mohan kameshwaran who is another uh, leading otologist uh, in the world and he is uh, uh, going to talk on implantable hearing devices this is on january 19 saturday night uh, live for you now we will straight away go on to the topic stapy surgery by dr manoj monika over to you uh, uh, dr manoj the stage is all yours hello can you hear me yes yes we can hear you loud and clear okay now um uh, good evening everyone it's pretty late uh, for many people but for janaki i think the day just begins uh, for people like us we all work late nights um so it's uh, uh, oh, glad no, to meet uh, you i just want to tell you that uh, this is being viewed by various parts of the world sometimes in america it can be even morning and oh. there are people now from mexico who have uh, joined and so we have uh, indonesians who are actually sitting through 1 o'clock and things like that oh, so wow. there is no time frame here it's, okay. so it's, it's the world here watching it it's like freemasonry the sun never sets okay now um, i'm glad to be uh, joining here and uh, when janaki told me this i was a bit anxious because i have not spoken to audience who is not exact fun but it's a, it's a very new experience so uh, let's start off this with this now and uh, like uh, uh, my dear friend janaki said um, i bow before professor stamberger because he i think is a man who changed a lot of things in ie i think he brought about a sea change in the way things did and to imagine that at 74 is no longer with us is, it made me sad the whole of yesterday anyway so let's uh, straight away go on to uh, the screen share then uh, shall we yeah please so i will be now sharing uh, my screen with you and i'll be running my presentation so can you see the screen now yes please yes okay now um we call this topic stapy surgery from a to z because we would like to cover everything that has to be talked about in stapy surgery now we all know that stapy surgery stapy autosclerosis is a metabolic disease that involves the aortic capsule and the ossicles um there is abnormal resorption or deposition of bone and there is fixation of stapy which we would see the the fact that there could be this metabolic disease and resorption or deposition of bone 
without actual clinical hearing loss is something that we should never forget. But for, the, for many of us, patients present to us with conductive hearing loss here, and some of them even have sensorineural hearing loss, uh, in, along with conductive hearing loss, what we call mixed hearing loss. And there are some people who present purely with sensorineural hearing loss. We must never forget, however, that autosclerosis is a progressive disease. What could be a purely sensorineural hearing loss, tomorrow could be a mixed, and tomorrow could be a, a complete sensorineural hearing loss, irrespective of what you might be doing to the patient today. Now, um, why do people get autosclerosis? Now, this is something that we always wondered. When we were very young, I remember that uh, when I passed my uh, post 30 years back, um, we all thought that autosclerosis is purely a genetic thing. We thought that if your mother or father gets it, you will get it. And people always thought that um, pregnancy would make it worse and so on. But the exact cause is still unknown. With two by two thirds of all patient autosclerosis have family history of hearing loss. It is supposed to be autosomal dominant condition with incomplete penetrance. Infections, um, uh, we have our uh, dear friend, uh, Professor Arun Gadre, uh, Janaki also knows him well. Uh, he had actually brought out this paper about measles being a causative factor in autosclerosis. They have found that there was a virus RNA sequence found in active autosclerotic lesions. Because this explains something very different because people at that time did not understand why over a period of time, autosclerosis cases got lesser and lesser. When we were young, there were surgeons, brilliant surgeons who were doing hundreds of autosclerosis a month. They were, there was, a, in particular, there was a Lempert hospital in Chennai where the Professor Subramaniam used to do minimum three autosclerosis cases a day. And suddenly over a period of time, this disappeared. People stopped having autosclerosis and you all wondered why. This probably explains it because when you have, when you have something called a viral thing causing autosclerosis with, with vaccination going around all over the world, it is quite feasible that autosclerosis cases come down. There is also something called autoimmune, type 2 collagen, metabolic and other endocrine disorders like pages which can cause therapies fixation. But I think for now, we will look at two major causes. One could be a genetic, a second could be the viral uh, RNA thing. As for every disease, there are multiple treatment options. And whenever you have multiple treatment options, we know that nothing is actually the best. So there is medical treatment. We have many, many years have used sodium fluoride, but of course over, a, over the past many years, we have never used it, at least me, not for the last 15 years, because we know that one, it probably doesn't change anything. Second, there are some undesirable side effects, so we don't use them. Bifosomizoplate has been touted as one of the methods in which we can stop the, the progression of autosclerosis. This is still something that has been explored. Personally, I've not used it, but there are people who have used it. We all know that for anybody with a hearing loss, hearing amplification is a good thing. So you can use hearing aids for autosclerosis. In fact, whenever a patient comes to you with autosclerotic hearing loss, one of the first things that you can tell him is that if you have a hearing loss, a hearing aid is probably the easiest thing for him to do. That is something that should never be forgotten. And of course, there is also surgery. Surgery, you can put them under four main headings. One of them was the old stepidectomy, which is a second in my list there where you completely remove the stapes and um, you um, put in a process after putting in a fat or a weight plug. Now the issue with stepidectomy, even though it worked brilliantly in many people. Uh, Dr. Manoj, can I stop you for a question please? Oh, please. So uh, one of the participants wants to know, do you give sodium fluoride at all for autosclerosis? No, I, I did mention that I never give sodium fluoride. I've never given sodium fluoride uh, for the last 15, 20 years. And I have not started giving bifosphonase, even though I am still waiting for that particular thing. I, I am asking a few people how it is being done. There are some results, but one of the things that we don't get is we don't get this active autosclerotic foci. Uh, so so I, I would still keep my, uh, my reservations on that. Uh, I, I don't use them, frankly. Okay, thank you. Now, stepidectomy was something where um, I mentioned you remove the whole step. Is. Now, what happened to people with stepidectomy was that they tended to have good hearing over a period of time. There was, of course, considerable uh, dizziness. We had people who had uh, surgery. I've seen personally some of the old staff operating. Patient had severe dizziness after surgery. A lot of them tend to have good hearing. 
but there were a significant amount of people who tended to lose hearing over time. The which is why John Shear actually started off stepidotomy, where he actually said that you can make a small fenestra, put in a piston to the size of the fenestra, and you can close off that fenestra opening with a vein or fat or whatever. And by retaining most of the stepi's foot plate and removing the superstructure, you would actually give far better results. And I think that was the single most important advancement in orthostatic surgery. People started doing surgery. We started having long-term good results, but they were still failures. We shall come to that later. There is, of course, bone conduction implants. For somebody who's got severe hearing loss and uh, who's not willing for orthostatic surgery, or somebody who's too old probably is unfit for surgery, you still have a bone conduction hearing aid like the, the bone bridge or the Baha was, or even a vibrant sound bridge put on the round window could still give you conductive hearing a part, uh, amplify the conductive part of the, of the ear and give um, serviceable hearing to the patient. Cochlear hear implants have also been useful. Personally, I'm operated on seven patients with autosclerotic um, hearing loss, profound hysteria of the child and, and cochlear implants are a miracle. For somebody who's had failed surgery, who has got profound hearing loss in both ears, who thinks that the world is at its end um, and cannot do anything more, cochlear implants give phenomenally good hearing to people. I have patients who talk to me over the phone to me. Now, these are the treatment options. Now, what has changed uh, uh, in, in, in surgery? In the 80s, it was very fashionable to do stepy surgery. Stepy surgery was the, what do you call that, the, the coking over, like uh, my friend Suri says. It was a given to have vertigo when suppose they said that if you do a step surgery properly, patient must be dizzy and um, taste alteration was something that was a given because you always cut the cord up. Stepidectomy was a rule, vein interposition was used, processes were pretty crude, they were made of wire, they were made of fat, imaging was never used, we never thought about imaging because those days one, CT scanning was not there, CT scans even though they were there, of very poor resolution. There was a strict um, no-no to surgery in only hearing ear. People said that if you have uh, one ear that is gone deaf, no one should touch the other ear. People also did not operate in severe mixed hearing loss. Lasers were uncommon even though uh, Perkins did develop it. Microdrill was unheard of. In fact, microdrill came after the laser. And um, uh, processes were very good. And hearing loss is something that was noted very often. People said that there was, in fact, there was a very famous surgeon who used to tell people that you will hear for 30 years and then you will go deaf. And a lot of people did turn out that way. We do not know how. But now what won't change now. It is still fashionable to do step surgery. People who do step surgery stutter out as if they do something seriously um, big. Uh, vertigo and alteration is considered an error. If somebody comes to you for step surgery and you do surgery and the patient is dizzy, you would say that something has gone wrong in the way in which you did surgery. That's what it is. And technically, you should have no alteration in taste. People should go back with a normal taste. Stepidotomy is the rule. I don't think, unless it is a very exceptional circumstance, which I will actually tell you later, stepidotomy um, is the rule. We don't do stepidectomy. People use seal, people don't use seal, which is uh, not very, we don't, still don't approve. Jean uh, Bernard Cosse, Jan Bernard Cosse in the Bizier, in, in the in cause clinic, actually had. Um, propagated this whole technique of using the weighing graph, which he said was mimicking the annular ligament of the stapes. But over a period of time, multiple studies have not proven that a weighing graph is actually superior. Processes have become very sophisticated. Can I, can I uh, interrupt oh, please. you for, for a few no. questions from our audience? Mm -hmm. Okay, Dr. Shah Wali is asking you, sir, what's the role of CD scan in diagnosing autosclerosis? Can I come to that later? I am going to go do, do that. Okay. I'll, I'll be, I mean, I'll be handling that in great detail uh, when I'm dealing, when I'm dealing this. Okay, so okay. the next is from Soma Sundaram uh, Chakkinga. What is the lowest stage of the patient diagnosed with autosclerosis? Uh, autosclerosis in children have been uh, reported. In fact, the youngest child that I operated was seven years old. Okay. Uh, Ah, yes. And um, this was uh, his sister who was 11 was operated by me when she was 11. And when they bought the younger boy, I thought of something else. It was also autosclerosis and I operated him too. And both of them in both years. And the first surgery was done, I think, 11 years back. They are big children now. But still, the hearing is good. Uh, I have operated on um, children, many children in the age group between 10 and 12. 
but six was probably the lowest I operated. I mean, and I looked at literature. I think there have been reports of children between five and six who have been operated. So it's oh. not it's not unusual to have hearing loss. Autosclerosis. You can also argue that it's probably not autosclerosis, probably congenital stapes fixation, but in effect, the the it's all the same. Now, please carry on. Okay. Now, uh, I shall now first demonstrate what is an optimal technique to do stapes surgery. Okay. Because uh, when whatever we talk later is going to be related to what uh, we are doing uh, in stapes surgery. So, this is my video on the optimal technique. It's a short video. It just shows you what should be done. I'll be talking along with it. If you want, I can run it through again. Now, the critical steps in stapes surgery are one is to make the proper incision. The incision, the anterior incision should start in front of the handler malleus because there might be some case with slipidial fixation. You raise the temporometer flap and then you have to see the round window. Why do you have to, I'll, I'll pause it a minute here. Now, why do you have to see the round window is that, see, one of the important things in autosclerotic surgery is that um, there are two cases where you don't operate. In fact, you don't operate at all. One is where you have a pulsatile round window. A pulsatile round window is a sure sign there's going to be a gusher. This is actually an excellent condition, which um, excellent recessive condition, which is, um, which, is which, um, which can happen with a white cochlear aqueduct, happens in young males. Many members in the family have deafness. And if you just about touch the step, is gone. You're going to have a profound hearing loss. The second condition where you don't operate is where you have a autostatic focus on the round window. You don't want to mess with that. So your first incision, should be able to show you the round window. You can see the round window here. Now, if you look at the round window closely and it is not pulsating, then uh, you, you can actually pretty much eliminate the possibility of a gusher. There's one thing that you need to do. So I shall go back on that thing a little bit more. So when you open up here, you see the round window, which is what you want to see. You may or may not see the ossicular chain at that point of time. Because generally, when you look into the middle ear, uh, when you open the terminometer fan, you will see the uh, incudostipital joint and probably part of the step is screwed up. I shall go through the video once again. So now what you do is then you have to curate. The curating has always got to be done away from the ossicular chain because there you will prevent an inadvertent injury to the, uh, to the ossicular chain. Now I will, I will actually freeze it here now. What have I done? I have actually dislocated the incudostipital joint. This has actually been uh, described many times by uh, Peter Wansan, who is from the cost clinic, who said that the only way to actually eliminate the possibility of a malleo incudal fixation is by dislocating the incudostipital joint and moving the malleus so that you know that that is moving free. And then you touch the stapes because we always used to originally touch the stapes. The stapes will still not move if there is malleo incudal fixation. So, this is what we have done. Uh, you can see it again. So, I shall uh, rewind a little bit more. So, you make a, take a small knife cut the incudostipital joint and then move the malleus. Can you see that? When you move the malleus, you will have uh, uh, the movement. And here, what you do is that you, you can actually reduce the posterior crude or the stapes. Now, the crude or the stapes limits your view of the round window. I'm sorry, the oval window. Now, you can remove the crude with a fine instrument. You can remove it with crude with a lathe, <laughs> or you can remove it with a, with a micro drill. The advantages of removing are twofold. One is that you actually see the foot plate very clearly. Second, you're weakening the crura. Here again, we are talking about a complication. I'll be talking about complication in this very slide. Now, if you do not weaken the crura, at the end of the procedure, when you take out the stapes, what can happen is that the force that you apply onto the stapes, depending upon whether the, 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 or the focus is thick or thin, can actually dislocate the stapedial foot plate and cause vertigo and hearing loss. You don't want that to happen. So you have to weaken the crura. This technique was actually taught to me by Dr. Ashish Bumkar, who uh, many of us in India knows, uh, one of the most uh, um, well-known autologists and uh, well-known pinna plastic surgeons in this part of the world. So he- now, now, uh, just uh, want to uh, interrupt you here. Again, uh, Dr. Ashish Bumkar, uh, he does what is called the amputation of the head. What is your- Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I will come to that thing. He, he, he has I've done it a few times. It is nice yeah, because then you don't do anything. Is, uh, but I will come to that later thing. Now here, uh, when I make the crura thin, I can see the whole foot plate. I can also decide what length of the piston that you need to keep, which is what I'm doing here. So the ideal length of the piston that you keep should actually go into the uh, vestibule 
no more than half of the thickness of the um, the incus long process. Now, how do you do that? Because when you keep the piston here, that's a stem of the piston, that's a ring. And if you keep the piston on the foot plate and the stem touches the incus, if you put the fenestra, if you put the piston into the fenestra, it will only go in that much depth into the vestibule. Because, uh, see, you are talking about the saccule that is far away from the foot plate. Distance between, average distance between the foot plate and the saccule is about 2 millimeter. Now, if you put in about 0.4 or 0.6 millimeter inside, you are not stimulating the vestibule, thereby there will be no vertigo. So here is what I am doing. I am actually uh, measuring the distance. See, can you see that? I am actually kept it there. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Did you say something, Jani? No. No, no, no. I just said yes, we could see. Okay. Now here, what I am doing is I am drilling away the anterior crust. Now this is not very easy to do. You have to take the uh, micro drill and drill away the anterior crust because here we are weakening not only the posterior crust but also the anterior crust. But sometimes this is not feasible. You can elevate the mucosa over the foot plate. This can be done because when you elevate the mucosa over the foot plate, you are having a, a foot plate that is nice and clean, into which you can actually make a drill hole and not allow blood to get inside. There are two major enemies of the vestibule. One is bone dust, second is blood. So if we don't allow bone dust and blood to get into the vestibule, or even in a cochlear implant, you actually preserve hearing. We all heard about that. So here, what I'm doing is we are actually going to drill the foot plate now. And before that, you can take out a vein graft. So this is a technique of taking out the vein graft. You take it, you remove the adventitia, and you can spread it and take a nice two, three little pieces. So here what we are doing is that, I said freeze it now, you are, you are drilling the foot plate. Now the foot plate drilling should be done in an extremely slow manner. It should be micro millimeter by micro millimeter, which means that you actually make it thin, thin, thin and then hold. Now the one of the things that you do when you drill is that bone dust collects there. So, so what do people do? They take a little sucker, a 26 sucker and suck it out. This is bad. Because you might have a little hole which you'll be sucking out and then that will cause vertigo. So one of the important methods of doing this is by using a small piece of gel form, you see that there, putting it on the foot plate and that will suck out all the water or the fluid or the blood or whatever bone does. So thereby you can have an atraumatic suctioning on the foot plate without actually causing any movement. So you can, I shall run this once again. So here it is. Uh, can, I, can I stop for some few questions please? Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, there is a doctor called Farooq Ekon from uh, Saudi Arabia who wants yeah. to ask a question to you. He says, uh, Professor Manoj, uh, we know stretching of cardiotipani nerve is more harmful than cutting it. Yes, yes. Uh, what do you believe about it uh, when it comes in your way? Yeah, yeah, it is absolutely important. See, the, the whole technique of corda removal, which I shall, um, uh, if you are, if time permits, I can show you later, is that. Um, when we actually are curating the, the bone, we actually curate the corda canal. Now what you see the corda that is seen here is not stretched. It is actually separated from its canal. So you should never ever stretch it because I should show it to you at the end of this presentation. When you put the corda back, it should never look stretched. If it is stretched, it is gone. So if at all you have thing that when the views, like for example, today's tapetectomy was a very difficult one, very narrow canal, a very short incurs. So I had to actually cut the corda. So you can either cut the corda or separate it, but never stretch it. I'm glad you brought that out, but we shall be talking about that later. So one more question from Dr. Uh, you, you don't mind taking questions, right? Dr. Yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Okay, Dr. Minish Jurikar from Bombay. Oh. Wants to know, hello, hello Dr. Manoj. Have Hi. in your experience seen a vein graft helps in reduction of post-operative giddiness? It's a, it's a great question. Okay, now let me tell you what I did. When in my first many years of doing surgery, I used a micro pick and fat and no vein graft. Now this was the time when there was a lot of giddiness happening. There were people with giddiness. There were people who had unsteadiness. This all happened. Then I switched over to the skeeter and the vein graft together. Now when I started using the vein graft and the skeeter, I patients stopped having these giddiness. Now I do not know, I did not know at that time which was a skeeter where I was weakening the foot plate and thereby causing no trauma on the foot plate, or was it the vein graft that was causing less acoustic trauma? And now, then I met um, uh, Dr. Anand uh, from, from uh, Bombay 
So he told me that um, you know, in, in Jutling in University, they don't use the wing graph. They just put it in. They, in fact, don't even seal it. So for many cases, I stopped using the wing graph. And I followed these patients up for many years. And I found that there was no real difference between these two people when you use the wing graph and don't use the wing graph. So, and when I started using the laser, which we will see later, I stopped the wing graft altogether. So right now my wing graft use would be limited to situations where I have to remove a large part of the foot plate, or if I, in some case of revisions when I take out the whole foot plate. So right now, no wing graft. So I don't think it really matters. I think what matters in, uh, in preventing giddiness and postoperative was, I think making a proper side sinistra and not causing a, a rocking movement on the foot plate. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, now what? See here, I am making this drill. I am suctioning. I am making the drill. I am suctioning, and then you have this nice round hole, and I keep the vein graft over that. This is the old technique, and then you put the piston into the fenestra, and then hook it onto the incus. Can you see that? This should be no. one. Beautiful. Now, see, the, the technique should be like this. It should go into the vestibule, onto the incus, not onto the incus, into the vestibule. Okay, now I, I will uh, rewind it a little bit better. Okay, now see, you have seen this vein, the corda here. The corda looks absolutely normal. I shall show this once again. Now, the corda is now being repositioned and looks normal. If it looks stretched, it is gone. The stephys cruda can be removed or cannot be removed. Now there are some people who just fracture it and now it lie on the on the uh, promontory. There are some people who remove it, but removing and not removing, I don't think it really matters a lot. But I have had one case where uh, when I had fractured, the somehow had come back and then fused again. So after that, I always remove. So and then uh, we will uh, close the wound and we will see the, um, the small vein graft which doesn't have to be closed. So that's a video on, um, on autosclerosis. This is a general base video to tell you how to prevent complications. So once again, corda injury should not be there. You should not have a tympanic membrane tear. You should uh, prevent a gusher by anticipating it up front. You should not operate on somebody with a uh, fixed uh, round window, uh, autosclerotic focus on round window. You should not cause movement on the foot plate. You should make the fenestra exact middle of the stippies of foot plate because Anything anterior might cause dizziness, anything posterior might have poorer hearing. So the ideal thing should be middle. How do you know it's a middle? Only when you see the whole foot plate. So which means that if you uh, remove the posterior crust, you see the whole foot plate, then you can decide where to make the fenestra. You should not put too long a piston, which will cause dizziness. Too short a piston, that will cause perilymph leak. So that is why you have to measure. And then you can, um, uh, by putting it first into the into the crora, into the vestibule, and then onto the um, uh, onto the incus, will prevent dislocation of the incus because that you are doing it under vision. And then uh, by closing the flap and ensuring that there is no tear, because a post-operative chronic otitis media is something that you and I don't want. Now there are many kinds of pistons available. Now you have these uh, fluoroplastic pistons which I use most of the time. I use these uh, titanium pistons also. Now there was a period of time where I used only titanium pistons. I think it was for about three years. I did only titanium pistons. Uh, the first soft clip that you see here, brilliant pistons. Um, and then I tried to compare what I'm seeing with a titanium piston vis-a-vis -vis a, a fluoroplastic piston. I found out that there was actually no difference uh, because I stopped that and then started doing uh, the fluoroplastic again because there was no short-term improvement in the cells in between those two and then after three years did again audiograms to find out whether there was any change between these two I agree three years is too short so there's actually no, no difference so right now my protocol is to use a fluoroplastic piston here most of the time use a titanium only when I find a very thin incus or a very thick incus because when you have a very thin incus or very thick incus you can actually damage it by using a uh, a, a piston which could uh, not sit completely on it or could actually move and then cause necrosis or incus long process. So if I have somebody with a thinned out uh, incus or somebody with too thick incus, I use the titanium clip. I use nitinol also. So that this is a nitinol process where you can put it there and using a shot of laser, you can make it shrink, which means you don't need to crimp it. But due to the extreme cost, I don't use it anymore. 
Now about diameter, what diameter would you use in stephy surgery? There have been a lot of studies, you can see that Shabana in 1999, Fish in 1982, Silverstein in 1998, and they all did a lot of these studies and found out that there was significant better closure in the 0.6 millimeter group. A lot of uh, stephy surgeons use a 0.4 millimeter because easier to manipulate. I use a 0.6 because I also believe that from changing from 0.4 to 0.6, I did found, find out there was better closure of the airborne gap in the lower frequency. So I think it's important to have a 0.6 millimeter, unless of course you have some condition where you can't put in a 6 millimeter. It's very inefficient. So you have a lot of um, um, uh, studies, you can see all this. So there was, uh, without interposition, 0.6 millimeter associated better results than 0.4 millimeter. Um, now, there have been very good surgeons who still use 0.4 millimeter, but they all say that if you use a 0.4 millimeter, it's better to use a vein interposition. 0.6 millimeter, you don't have to. This is again debatable. Now, one of the reasons why uh, I started using 0.6 was because of this. Now, we get a lot of patients like this. Can you see this? Severe uh, mixed diagnosis. Pardon? It's clearly seen. Can you see it? Yeah, very clearly seen. Pardon? It's very clearly seen. It's very clearly seen. Oh, very clearly seen. So now you can see these people have about uh, 95 dB uh, low frequency and about 70 dB high frequency loss on both sides. When I was using the 0.4 millimeter piston here, I never got these overclosures in this group. I think that is one of the main reasons why I shifted over from a 0.4 to a 0.6. Now here you can see that this patient has been shifted from 90 dB hearing loss to 50 dB hearing loss, better than the higher frequency, which means that technically this patient is not a hearing aid candidate, becomes a hearing aid candidate. Now, this is something that is important when you do stapy surgery. You can also see that over a period of time, these are patients who have been operated. Um, this is one year later, this is two years later, and uh, 17 to 18, the hearing improves and improves till it becomes preoperatively. It is uh, 63 and 67. And uh, two years after surgery is 23 and 20, which is what we need to see in, in autosclerosis surgery. See, if you want to have good hearing, what do you need? You need to have 30 dB in at least one year, or you should have 40 dB in both years. This is the type of hearing that you need to avoid a hearing aid use. So this is exactly why we do surgery. Now, somebody asked me about, uh, um, about CT scan. Now, there is indeed uh, two things about CT scan. One is that you need to know the CT scan to find out if there is cochlear autosclerosis. Second, you need to know to find out how thick the foot plate is. And third, you need to do a CT scan to find out if it is something else other than autosclerosis. Now, we shall be doing, dealing with all of them as time goes by. Now, this is a, a Simons and Fanning grading system for autosclerosis. What you see here, zero is when there is no autosclerotic foci. Grade one, when there is only this, this uh, foot plate is actually thickened, and you can see thickening here in the yeah. foot plate. Uh, and two, two A, two B, and two C is when the cochlea is involved. Two A is when only the basal turn is involved. You can see the basal turn involved, the middle turn apical turns free. Two B is when the middle turn and apical turn is partly involved, and two C when there is complete involvement. And grade three, when there is complete opacification of the whole cochlea, when you get what is called this pericochlear lucency, so the double halo sign, which is a telltale sign of cochlear autosclerosis. Now, when you operate a cochlear implant on these patients, you should use an implant that is not stimulating the, the facial nerve, which runs like that here. So if you have an implant, a full banded electrode, in this case, this bone is so spongy that every time the patient hears something, the facial nerve will twitch. So this is one reason. Now, how does imaging influence surgery? This is what you do. See, if there is, see, this is what you do. If there is speed discrimination is uh, less than 30, you go directly to cochlear implantation. Don't worry. This is for advanced autosclerosis. So, if there is 50, 30 to 50 percent, you do a CT scan. If it is type, if you see if it is type 2C or 3. If it is no, the airborne gap is more than 30, you go for stepidoptomy. If the airborne gap is less than 30, you go for cochlear implant. Whereas Type 2C or 3, you go directly to cochlear implantation. If the speed discrimination between 50 to 70, you do a CT scan, sorry, do a CT scan, and then same thing, you, there is no 
uh, types 2 C or 3, airborne gap more than 30, you do steparectomy. And if it is not more than 30, you do a hearing aid. So the arm between uh, whether you do a hearing aid or a cochlear implant or just CA alone depends upon feed discrimination. So this is how imaging would influence your decision making whether you give a hearing aid, whether you give a steparectomy or a cochlear implantation in those cases where there is far advanced autosclerosis. I do agree that to do a, a CT scan to just to find out every case of autosclerosis is actually a bit of an overkill. But there are a lot of people who use it. Now, we use a lot of tools for steparectomy. One is the, 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 the micro drill. You have two major kinds of micro There are plenty, but uh, there is one, uh, the most used one. This is the Zomet Skeeter. This is a bean air auto tool. Both of them are brilliant. Uh, they are equally good, I would say, except that uh, the bean air uh, drill tips are much more expensive, but they say they can use it many times. Skeeter's tips are fantastic, very light, but they are technically implemented for single use. So, uh, but we do use it for four times after plasma sterilization. Uh, but if you want to be using your drill bits for a longer period of time, you go for them. But if you want a little bit better precision, you go for these. The one advantage of using the Skeeter is that most of you have a debrider at home. Uh, the Medtronic, which can be fixed on to the Medtronic debrider. Now, um, I shall show you a small video how the uh, the Skeeter is used. Can you see this is a very thick foot plate, yellow colored foot plate. And the Skeeter can go there again and again and again. This takes many minutes. You can see how long we do. And then keep on drilling and drilling and drilling till it thins out. To it. So this, this could never have been done without a skeeter. So you can take a pick, hand pick and make out a drill, a drill hole. This will be like making a burr hole uh, in the skull, which will be just there. But whereas a skeeter, it will thin out the entire foot plate and then you can make a fenestra exactly where you want. And this thing can never be done with any other instrument, not even a laser. If you want to use, have a very thick foot plate, if you thin it out completely, and you want to fashion your fenestra exactly where you want, you need a skeeter. Now laser can eliminate many dangers. See what, see how, what is the purpose of using a laser? One is that laser can eliminate um, bleeding during cutting the tendon. It can um, prevent rocking of the stapy during movement of the stapy superstructure. It can prevent fracture of the foot plate and it will prevent excess mobilization of the incus. Now, uh, they were, um, there is also a comparison between the slide should I make. Before that, there is stepidectomy and stepidotomy, and they say that there is no statistical difference between two groups. Now, I shall show you how we do a laser stepidotomy. So, this is a patient with the 43 years mixed hearing loss. You do the same steps as the other one. The corda is not retracted. Can you see that? The corda is kept there. The laser is used to get away the tendon. Then you look at the fenestra, make that hole, one shot, that's all you need. And put in the piston, like I mentioned earlier, no vein graft. So the laser, uh, when you use a laser, it makes one, uh, here I'm using a small fat graft, but you don't even have to use it at times. Now the laser, the advantages of laser is that most of the troubles that are coming to you when you're a learner surgeon is eliminated. Uh, my friend um, Irwin Officius was telling me that in their university in, in, in um, uh, Netherlands, when they compared the results of trainee surgeons vis-a-vis -vis the experienced surgeons using laser, there was not so much a difference. Because when you have somebody uh, training, the damages happen when you dislocate the foot plate, when you make too deep a, a fenestra or too superficial a fenestra, all these things are eliminated by using the laser. But then if you ask me whether it is worthwhile buying an expensive equipment uh, to do a stapy surgery, I mean, it's your takes. It all depends upon what your surgical load is. Now, vertigo and technique. Now, there is uh, there has been a lot of studies on what kind of, uh, you know, I mentioned that when you do a, a laser stapidotomy, you're making a small hole, you're not touching the foot plate, thereby you can actually eliminate vertigo. Now, there has been a study which compared the risk of SNHL and tinnitus with microdrill laser and uh, uh, other techniques. So now where all but one study had higher airborne gap closure in the laser group. 
So if you compare all these studies, Osler, a very famous man, uh, and uh, Badran, Barbara, uh, so and so, uh, they were all studied, Tip one, had higher AB closure in the laser group, probably because you're making a better fenestra. Risk of SNHL was higher in the micro drilled group compared to the laser group. Strangely, tinnitus was more in the laser group. I have not actually seen that in my series, but uh, there are some people who complain of tinnitus, not very specific to what technique you use. The most important thing here is that there was no foot plate fracture in the laser group. So if you want to eliminate a foot plate fracture, you should use a laser. Or you should have extremely skilled hands in other people where you can use a drill millimeter by micro millimeter by micro millimeter and making a small fenestra. I have seen some can brilliant we, uh, things. Can we stop for a question please? Yes. yes. So Dr. Uday Muthukumar wants to know, uh, in case you have a dehiscence of the facial nerve, is it still, uh, you know, you can use a laser? Is it a contraindication? Yeah, that's a good question. Now Muthukumar, um, See, when you touch the laser with the, when you touch the facial nerve with the laser, you get a paralysis. There's no doubt about that. And that's very bad. So when you have a foot plate dehiscence, uh, which is foot, uh, uh, laser, the, foot, the facial nerve is coming onto the foot plate, it would be advisable not to use the laser. You should not. But of course, there are some techniques. What you can do is see, the, the, generally the foot plate fracture, uh, the, the facial nerve collapse is not exactly the facial nerve collapse. Now the facial nerve is covered by a, a, a sheath and there is fluid between the actual nerve and the sheath. So when you have an area where the bone is not there, what happens is that the fluid collects in the sheath and the sheath prolapses. So it is not the facial nerve that is actually prolapsing. You have an abnormal facial nerve running on the foot plate where you don't want to, want to do a stepirectomy. But if you have a, a, a sheath prolapsing outside, what you can do is you can take a small elevator and push the facial nerve for some time. And if you leave the elevator there for about a minute and a half to two minutes, when you take out, voila, you don't see the uh, facial nerve. There you can actually use a, a drill and um, uh, or a laser again. So if you actually see a fa facial nerve that is outside, you can actually try compressing it. I've done it and which actually doesn't seem to do much harm. But if you have a facial nerve that is running across the foot plate, then of course, uh, you don't want to be touching that with the laser or a micro drill or with any other instrument. Is it? Does it answer your question? I think that answers. And do you have any classification of the facial nerve running over the foot plate? I think there is, but I really don't know, Janjam. I don't know. Do you, do you know that? Do you remember? No, no, I don't know. I don't know. I don't. I, I think I read it somewhere, but I don't. It is not standard, so I don't remember. So, what is your take on maybe uh, uh, if there is a uh, maybe the half of the foot plate, the facial nerve is running over it? You still move that patient now and put it. And what happens to the piston? Is it pushed off later at a later date? No, by because, the because, the, no, because the, it is the sheath, the neural ML sheath with the fluid that is coming out. This coming back onto the patient uh, does not seem to be affecting the piston movement so much. Okay. So we don't, we have, I've actually followed these patients for many times, many years, and we don't, have not found these patients having further hearing loss or any slippage of piston. Okay. Now, there's also one more laser that you can use. There's a KTP laser. But let me warn you, KTP laser is not the ideal laser for step surgery. It does many good things. One, it prevents bleeding. Uh, it, um, it is fantastic for bleeding, but it, it is actually causing a lot of heat. So some of my first cases that I did with KTP laser ended up with temporary facial weakness. Terrible. But they all recovered, luckily. So this is what you do with the KTP laser. So the same technique, you are elevating the flap. And you're seeing the stepi, the crura after curating. The two collar being separated. You can use a laser with a touch technique. You can vaporize the posterior crust completely. It's all done with the laser. You can vaporize the foot plate vessels. And over that, you can make a fenestra with the skeeter. So this is uh, done to reduce blood. So if you have somebody with a blood vessel running across the foot plate, uh, a CO2 laser will mess it up because CO2 laser does not have so much a blood sealing capacity like a like a KTP laser, unless it is a big. I have a question, Dr. Manoj. Yes. Uh, uh, if you find vessels over the foot plate mm -hmm. and you don't have a laser, so ah. what do you recommend for these people? I mentioned in my old uh, the first um, video that I showed, you can elevate the mucus off it. 
but it bleeds a lot, right? So for a yeah, long time, yeah, you have to elevate the mucus. So, uh, uh, gel foam, do you recommend? Adrenaline soaked gel foam should be kept, but you must understand that adrenaline is very autotoxic. So if you are after you keep adrenaline and you remove it, it's important that you actually put a little bit of saline and try to suck it off to make sure that no adrenaline remains there. Because adrenaline going into the foot plate could be pretty traumatic. So if you are keeping adrenaline over the foot plate to stop the bleeding, which I do sometimes, at the end of the procedure, what I do is I apply a few drops of normal saline and then suck it off to make sure that adrenaline doesn't remove on the foot plate, remove, remain on the foot plate, which is very important. Okay. And now, um, so that's a KTP. Um, now here, um, okay, this is a repeat slide. Now there are conditions where you use a micro drill along with the laser. So this is what I said earlier. So here uh, is a patient with uh, a transcanal approach using endolent speculum because a narrow canal. So elevating the this thing, your um, the the corda has been separated, and uh, you are seeing a thick vascular foot plate. Can you see that? It is wow. very thick. This is what Janaki mentioned. Can you see that? White and blood vessels running over it. It looks like a sebaceous or something. It is so thick. Now here what you can do is you can, uh, you are actually using the laser and then actually thinning it out, using the drill again to smoothen it out. Can you see that? So first you have to use a laser to make it avascular. Then you have to blue line it. And once it is blue line, keep the laser again and make a hole. This is what you do. So uh, you can, that's what it is. So you can actually use this. Here I'm using a, a Kulz piston because the incus look, there's a revision case. Uh, the, the drum was sitting on the on the uh, incus long process. So here the incus was thinned out. So I used a Kulz uh, processes and I also used a small piece of tracheal pericondrium because I did not want the drum to go sit back on the, on the incus and on the processes because it is a case which had a Timbriaplasty operated and where they found out that there was autosporotic focus and did not wisely did not do anything on the table. So here is a second. This is this uh, is where you can use a laser heater laser again to uh, to combine these two techniques to give good results. So we have a couple of questions, Dr. Manoj. Can we take it? Oh yes. Dr. Rajesh Chaudhary wants to know, sir, if the diameter of the vestibular aqueduct is more than two millimeters in CT scan. Yes. Or not? Now, an enlarged vestibular aqueduct is what you're talking about. Now, no. you, you must understand that whenever there's an acute enlarged vestibular aqueduct, the airborne gap that you see is not an airborne gap. Sorry, let me, I'll, I'll stop this video. The airborne gap that you see is not an actual airborne gap. The airborne gap is actually a third window effect. So if you find an enlarged vestibular aqueduct, Never do step erection. Don't do it because if you do it, you'll, what, you, what will happen? You will create a, a leak, a petalum fistula, and profound hearing loss. And you, you should understand that this airborne gap that you see is actually not going to be. It's not. It's not an airborne gap at all. Because day before yesterday, I operated a cochlear implant patient who was actually diagnosed to have a mixed hearing loss. The patient has bone conduction thresholds, bone conduction curve at 50, air conduction at 90, and the speed discrimination the aided bone conduction mode of zero. Now, how does it happen? It happens because the air conduction that you see um, in the airborne gap that you see in somebody with a third window, like a Mondini dysplasia, and this particular case is a Mondini, a wide vestibular aqueduct is not actually an airborne gap at all. So when you, so this is again one of the reasons why some people say that you have to image or autofluorosis, but because the proportion of that is so low, and because I do not agree that you should, you should subject somebody to um, to a, a imaging with, which causes some 600 x-rays worth of radiation just to find out these rare instances not warranted. But I would definitely do CT scanning. When? Suppose somebody comes to me with unilateral autosclerosis, unilateral conductive hearing loss. I will always do a CT scan. Somebody comes to me and says that my brother had stepy surgery and he became profoundly deaf. I will think that there is possibly a third window. I will do it. If my Audiometric thresholds are disproportionate to the speech audiogram. If I find a somebody with a with a 50 dB conductive hearing loss or, or 50 dB mixed hearing loss has got a speech discrimination of 40 percent, I would think there's something wrong. So here's where I will do imaging to find out. And like you asked, if at all you have a, a wide vestibular aqueduct, you will definitely not go and do stepedectomy in this case. Simply not worth it. Is that okay? 
Yeah, that's perfect. Uh, a few more questions. Uh, yeah, the people are actually pouring in. There are so many viewers and uh, really a great, great uh, uh, lecture you're giving. A lot of appreciation, but a few questions also. Please, sir, Doctor. this is from Dr. Paramita Saha from Bombay, sir. If incus dislocates, uh, then can you uh, keep a piston between the foot plate and the hand of malice or should we abandon the surgery? Paramita, you are going, you are preempting my next slide. <laughs> Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> that is good. I think she, she mind reads. Okay, whatever. Now, this is, um, uh, I'm going to talk about what is happening. I mean, that's her answer is the next slide. Okay, please carry on. If you actually dislocate an incus accidentally during surgery, I mean, I also mentioned during my initial critical steps videos that when you curate away from the ossicular chain, it's highly unlikely that you will um, dislocate the incus, but dislocation can happen. One of the main reasons why dislocations happen is because people don't use a good curette. One of the first imported instruments that I ever bought was a, was a curette made by Carl Stoss for, for a stepidotomy. I now have multiple, I have spigolentize, I have other things, but these instruments are worth their weight in gold. If you have a good curette, you will not damage the, uh, the incus. But imagine that you have damaged. Now, what would you want to do at that point of time? You can do two things. One, you can leave it there, just leave it there, and go in back again three or four months later and see if it is refixed back onto the onto the incus, onto the sorry, onto the malleus. And if you think it's pretty stable, you can go ahead and do it. But but what generally happens is once you dislocate it, it becomes ankylosed, so it doesn't work very well. So one of the things, if you are familiar with the technique that I'm doing next, you, if you can do a malleovestibular processes. I think that is the best thing that you can do for this particular patient by taking out the incus and putting in a malleable vestibular process because a, a, a loose incus is a danger. You know what can happen? This loose incus, you will put in a foot plate, you will, I mean, fin piston into the foot plate. Over a period of time, the incus will start sinking. And when it sinks, it will go into the vestibule. And I have seen one particular patient, which is terrible. I saw this patient with uh, uh, his notes that mentioned that incus had dislocated, somebody put in a piston, and then became profoundly deaf four years later. And then when I did a scan much later, I found that the whole piston was inside the vestibule, the whole thing. So please don't try to do um, any uh, tricks here. It's important that you either do a malleable vestibular processes or try to go in again and see if it is uh, still mobile where you can do a processes or you can um, uh, ask, go to a senior or somebody who's more well-versed in this technique. So I shall show this technique where a person actually had a stepidectomy surgery many years back and uh, over a period of time uh, lost his hearing. So this is a video on the malleovestibular process. So here, this is an end oral approach. I just like to have both hands and um, uh, making the flap. Always use bipolar on the end oral incision because you need to have a blood loss feed. So you are elevating the, uh, the, 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 the canal and inspect the ossicular chain. What is happening here? So this is what I want you to see. So you can see that the, the ossicular chain, the incus is nearly cut across. Can you see that? Can no. you see the incus? It's nearly cut across. Yeah, I see. So here, the, the middle part, why does it get cut? Now you have to understand. You can see the piston below there. If a piston is loose onto the incus, can you see if it is loose? The piston will move like this on the incus. And that can actually traumatize the incus long process much more than an overly tight piston. Uh, people always thought that over tightening was a problem. Over tightening was never the problem. Under tightening was the problem. So if you have it loose, it will move and cause movements on the foot plate and thereby uh, it will. Because if, if over tightening was a problem, the titanium process would never last because they all clip on the incus. So here um, I found that this incus was no longer viable. So what I did was I, I took it out and I bared the malleus handle. Malleus handle must be made bare. It has to be every bit of epithelium has to come off on the malleus handle. And then uh, we took out the incus, took the old piston out. This was done 20 years back, mind you, 20 years back. And I cured it a little bit more. The fenestra was still painted. You can see that. Let me, let me remind it a bit. Can you see that? The uh, fenestra it was still patent and then I removed some of the mucus over it and so that the piston fenestra became open again. I measured the piston once again, how long it must be. That is a malleable vestibular processes. 
and uh, shall go back a minute. Oops. See here, you have a clip and you have a ball and socket joint here. So you can actually put it onto the malleus and, and, and adjust the ball and socket joint in such a way that it goes into the vestibule. So here, uh, you are seeing this being adjusted and that is being clipped onto the, malle into the, onto the malleus and the ball and socket joint goes into the vestibule. Can you see that? That's how it is. It goes into the fenestra there. So this is a brilliant process because if you do it properly, you can have really good airborne gap closure with uh, this uh, process. I shall show you some results later on. Let you close. So um, now there are, there are some uh, studies that suppose nothing works so that uh, we can do cochlear implantation, which we will uh, do later. Now, why do steppy surgery fail? They fail because of poor visualization, inadequate training, less attention to detail, and rare but unknown factors. Now, what do you do when things don't go so well? You have to prepare yourself for the worst and I shall show you something. So here was my patient. Okay. Let me, this is my own patient where I shall freeze it now. So I have done this surgery, I think um, seven years before this particular video was shot. So he, she had a surgery and um, I did not remove the crura at that time. I actually, I was mentioning this to you earlier. I fractured the crura. I left it there or maybe I did not fracture it enough. So she came back to me seven years after the primary surgery and then said that she can't hear anymore. So obviously I had to go inside again. I, op I opened up and then I found that the piston was good. I first thought it was piston necrosis, incus necrosis. So I took out the piston. Can you see that? I'm taking out the piston with a small oh. right pick. The, the, state, the incus looks pretty much normal to me. Can you see that? Absolutely normal. Blood vessels on it. The incus is moving. There is no malleo-incutal fixation. I'm moving the malleus that also moves. So I'm taking the, the, the piston out. Now what do I see? I see some soft tissue there. I take all that and I find that there is uh, the piston is still attached to the anterior crust. Can you see that? I'm sorry. Incus is still attached to the anterior crust. So I think here when I fractured it, the anterior crust did not fracture. So I had to, um, I took out the anterior crust and put the piston back into the same fenestra that I made. I did not have to make a new fenestra. The same piston goes back into the same fenestra. So you can snap it back onto the incus. Can you see that? You can actually snap it back. So here what I've done is I have not actually opened the, the, the piston. Because if you open it, it, because it's an old piston, the elasticity may not be there. So I've actually taken the same piston, put it there, and with a right angle pick, snapped it back onto the incus long process where it stays there. So it's the same piston in the same fenestra. The only thing missing now was the anterior crust. Now here, you can see this video. So this is a patient who had... Uh, uh, this is a young lady with autosclerosis. Can you see a reasonably good result when I did stupidotomy for her in 2001. In four years, the conductive hearing was returned. When we decided to go back in 12 years later, this is what I found. What I've done is I'm taking the skeeter and making the whole foot plate thin. Like I mentioned earlier, I'm using the gel form to suck the blood. Measure the foot plate. 
looked at the thickness and then made the hole bigger. Same technique. First goes into the finestra and then on to the filters. This is what it is. After revision step dot me, you can see the hearing improvement. Goes to 30 dB from 50 dB. Now here um, is another patient who had uh, stepy surgery. There was a lot of difficulty in visualization, and uh, they, the patient was sent to me. And some of the good things that you should do. Is my audio muted? Yeah, perfect, perfect. Okay. A, a little bit, uh, if you can raise your voice, it will be great. Okay. Or, okay. So the short incus, you can actually even try to put, put in a, a piston sometimes, but actually you ideally need a bucket handle. Can you see that? This is another case that you did a revision two, two days after the primary surgery. This is the original surgery was not done by me. A good surgeon who decided not to do it because he thought the incus was too short. But it's important that you have this bucket handle processes if it is needed. <laughs> now, ah, here, this is something good. This is you have to see. Now, here was a patient who underwent surgery 10 years earlier to correct hearing loss, but okay, and then worse. So I thought it must be some uh, timeroplasty that was done. So I went inside. And when I opened that ear, I found that uh, there was an uh, incus it was between the malleus and the stapes. Can you see that here? Yeah. Now, uh, okay. Now, here, when I took out this incus, the incus was nice. When I took out that, the malleus was good and uh, it was fine. The malleus was all right and the stapes was completely fixed. So what I had to do was, I, I found the stapes was not moving at all. Can you see that? Completely yeah. fixed. Absolutely no movement. The round window was visible. So I cut out the stapes and removed it. And, you, and I, uh, that is, I am drilling out the posterior crus with the skeeter. The superstructure was removed. That's the ideal method of taking out the crust without damaging the or rocking the foot plate. Took a small piece of vein for harvesting. If you're using a malleable vestibular process, you should always use a vein. Always. And then made a small fenestra. Put the vein graft. This corda, however, is badly damaged. Put in a malleable vestibular processes. And see, so you have to clip it onto the malleus and gently manipulate it onto the, uh, onto the foot plate. So it seems to be in good position. I put some fat over it just to be doubly sure. And then uh, uh, close the flap. Okay, now everybody think it's great. The patient heard well. And I went off to a small holiday to Goa. Two days later, I get a phone call saying that the patient is really dizzy, throwing up like anything, and then has got himself readmitted back to the hospital with bleeding from the ear, vertigo and vomiting. When I went and opened up, I found that there was a lot of blood clots inside the ear. Can you see that? Yeah. And then I opened the ear. There were even blood clots inside the eardrum. And you see it's all blue in color. Hemotympanum. I opened the uh, flap and there was still a lot of blood clots. Can you see that? Complete blood. The whole ear was filled with blood. And I took very gently over this video looks nice but it took me a very long time to remove it and then i i found the the process is still there in position but i wanted to be sure so i what i did was i after sucking out all that blood i removed the processes and wanted to see how it was like i removed the fat that was kept there just a few days back took out the processes and uh, repositioned it back I just wanted to be sure the process is real with all the blood, it, it should not have gone outside. 
So that is how you manipulate it back into the vestibule. There. And I also tested the movement. Can you can see the rounded door reflex there? Yeah. And and closed it with a little piece of triangle cartilage as a support. And uh, everything was well. Now here, um, we did a post-op. That's a first revision, stepidotomy. That was done for something done many years back. And uh, this was after the second surgery. Oh, sorry, that got a bit mixed up. There's a triangle pericardium. What before. was the reason for the bleeding? I'll tell you that. So this is a re-revision. Next time that I did, I left uh, again after two days as a second post-operative vertigo and the hearing was really good after the second surgery. This is three months after the second surgery. Now, I wanted to find out what happened, why the patient had bleed. So we did the auditing of this case. We found out that who took what, who did what. We actually found out that there was a new nurse who actually mixed the xylokin and adrenaline in that day. She actually, when we infiltrate, uh, we use xylokin with adrenaline, right? Uh, we mix it one in hundred thousand. There was this girl who, who actually put a whole vial of adrenaline inside that. Oh. So it is possibly rebound bleeding from too much of adrenaline. And when I went back into the anesthesia records, we also found that the patient had severe tachycardia during surgery. It must have been adrenaline. I think the whole thing uh, points out to one fact that after that incident, I never let anyone mix my own adrenaline unless it's somebody that I know my doctors. Because this was a clear reason why if you put too much of any drug, it can cause trouble. So this patient would have had a completely normal post-operative period, saved me my holiday as well as a lot of heart heartache if that adrenaline was right. So this is definitely because of excess adrenaline. Now, uh, there is another uh, case where, uh, see, there is a, a patient who had an osteoplasty with, with that. Uh, and then when they did surgery, they found out that there was something wrong and they did, did a procedure whereby they tried to interpose something between a necrosed incus. So can you see that? And it actually was a fixed foot plate, which they didn't realize at the time. And here is one of the applications for a course processes. See here, with a necrosed incus, you can still put a clip onto the remaining part of the necrosed incus. The clip actually stays there. And this patient, the surgery is now done two years back, and the hearing is still stable. I put a small piece of fascia over it and close it. Just an example of what to do. Now, somebody asked me about foot plate fractures. Now, this was a patient who actually had a surgery at an, another place, a good surgeon, who actually called me immediately after surgery. He said that, sir, I have done this surgery, the steparectomy, the foot plate fractured. There's some CSF, the perilymph leak, what shall I do? I told him, you can actually close it off now with a weight, with a graft, with a fascia graft. Don't do anything. You can go back in later after maybe six, seven months. And then if there is still a trouble, you can actually do a, uh, uh, I mean, if there's no, no leak, you can do a step it off again. So that's what he did. He actually sealed it off and then was afraid to open it again. So he sent it back to me. I should show you what happened. So he was an abandoned procedure. So left ear of again, I am raising the terminal metal flap. And I see immediately there's something abnormal. See, this is a very short incus, and there's a lot of perichondrium that is put on the foot plate. Can I see that? Yeah. So I'm trying to take out the perichondrium, which has uh, become adhered there. So later I realized that it was a mistake to ask him to put perichondrium. It should have been some fat, it would have been easier to take off. So I took some time to take out. You can see how abnormal the incus is. I took out the perichondrium. It was actually very difficult to take it out. And then found that there was a fracture and leak. Can you see the? The perineum leaking? Yeah, yeah. So it here, is what yeah. I did, I actually took out some vein graft, prepared a vein, and wanted to do a laser of the make a hole. But whatever happened, I still could not make a proper hole. So what I did was, I took out the whole foot plate. Got the whole foot plate. Can you see the whole foot plate? Kept the graft over it, and over the graft, applied a standard processes. This was tense. I actually was worried because I didn't have a small hole to go into. I wanted to put it exactly where I wanted. 
have to do it very very slowly and then the in the the interest was slightly hypermobile so that's what it did so here wait wait let me just skip it so here and there is one more case that i want to discuss with you so here there is this patient who had was 31 years of age had many surgeries at 2011 Seven two thousand eleven, there was inferior scapular joint found fixed, inferior was dislocated, and cartilage kept on stapes. There was no information on stapes mobility. Left ear was revised in eleven two thousand three. Fenestra was made in a plate and point six into six millimeter piston inserted and crimped onto the necros incus. Right ear hemiplasty was done ten two thousand fifteen. There was no information on scapular stapes. All three were done at different places elsewhere. Can you believe what all this patient underwent? Now this patient comes to me, and then what my plan was to, was to stop using the hearing aid in one year and use a there was a lot of external otitis, left endoral exploratory anatomy with revision stepidotomy, curry malleo vestibular processes under G. This was my plan. So we did the surgery and look at the hearing improvement in the last year. So you will think that man, what a great result. Uh, Dr. Manoj operated, and uh, hearing improved from 90 dB to 45 dB. Brilliant! But the things did not happen that way. I tell you what happened. On the 17th of June, uh, 16th of June 2017, I put a malleo vestibular process on the left ear. I used a stator and carbon dioxide laser and put an MVP. The hearing deteriorated to 68 dB left ear. Now. That was two thousand eight. I told him that we will wait for six months and see. So he came back to me in December. In December two thousand seventeen, I again operated. I put a left transcranial re-revision stepidotomy. I took that out. I there was more bone obliteration. I drilled using stator and put in a malleable vestibular process. The hearing went back to seventy two. It was a month after I did the surgery. So here we have a patient who had a failed surgery, multiple surgery, already three surgeries done. I do one. Hearing reduced. I do the second. Hearing reduced even further. I am completely in an fix. I do not know what to do. I tell this patient that she listen. Uh, I this is only so much I can do. Let us tie a bone bridge or a cochlear implant. He tells me one important thing. He says the doc. Um, both times he operated, I heard a little bit for the first few days, and then it deteriorated. Maybe that you did something. You did not do something enough. So I'm willing to uh, risk it by making you operate on me one second. Look at that trust that patients give you. He's already had three surgeries. He's already had two surgeries from me, five, and wants me to operate on a sixth time. So which is what I did. So I did the re-revision. This time I made a bigger fenestra and uh, put in a process. That is where we got the result. I shall show you the video. So here. That is the process that came out, and that is the finest. I do not know how it regrew so much. So I made a lot of holes and drilled again and again, and uh, reapplied the same finest into the vestibule after drilling. So that's the question, Dr. Manoj. Can we have a question? Yes. So, what is your uh, uh, procedure for persistent stapedial artery? This is a question from the audience. Yeah, yeah. And now, thankfully, I have never had a persistent stapedial artery. Thankfully, I I think if it comes, I will abandon it because it, I am not worried about the small blood vessels that pass the stapes. A persistent stapedial artery is actually a branch of the internal carotid. Bleeding could be very severe. It could be bad. So I don't think it is worthwhile trying to do something silly there. So I think if I see a persistent stapedial artery. I will always abandon surgery, but if I see a small blood vessel, I do have a KTP laser, which which with which I I will laser it off. Now the I told you a lot of bad stories, but there are also a lot of good stories. Look at this, uh, Meenakshi, fifty uh, nine years old. In two thousand five, I operated on her after the hearing failed in the left ear, which was done twenty years back. So she was thirty uh, years old when this was operated. The 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 left ear was operated. Left ear actually deteriorated to 65 dB SN hearing loss. The right ear at 67 dB mixed hearing loss. So in 2005, I operated on a right ear. I uh, did a 4.7 millimeter, 0.6 millimeter piston, uh, standard technique, and the hearing improved at that time from 67 to 27. Can you see that? 
Now, yeah. when this event happened in 2005, 10 2005, this is this is uh, 6 2005. Four months later, the hearing was 27 dB. Left ear, of course, was a SN hearing loss. Now, this was 2005. 2007, the right ear still remained at 28. Can you see that? Left ear had, had gone down to 70. In 2009, the right ear was 32. 2 dB, you can give it for age, I think, because it was like five years after. The left ear had gone down to 72. So, you can have a 2 dB dip on both sides. And then in 2016, the right ear was 35. Uh, I'm sorry, 32. And in 2018, which is 13 years after primary surgery, when this lady is now 70 years old, 72 years old, is still 35 dB in the right ear, and the left ear has gone down to 80. 62 when I started off, 80 now, the right ear is 35. Now, you, can, you have to look at this patient, this old lady, who has now gone 15 years past her first surgery. Now, what has happened? Her left ear has deteriorated over time. The right ear has deteriorated, but only so little. See? So this, is, this comes back to your point as to why we should operate on somebody with uh, only hearing ear or somebody with on the other side in autosclerosis. See, when you do surgery for autosclerosis on one side, the patient immediately he hears well. Now, one of the arguments against operating on the second ear was that the stapes patients always have progression. This is definitely not true. We know that a non-operated ear progresses more than an operated ear. We have seen that. There is SN loss happening. We really do not know why people with autosclerosis after having stapidotomy tends to retain their hearing for a very long period of time. Uh, um, I might have told you all those stories, but all of them patients have had good hearing for many years now. So it is important that when you have somebody like this who has lost hearing in that ear following surgery, to be scared and not to operate on a right ear would have been truly criminal. Because she at 70, with the 35 dB hearing loss in one year, still does not need to use a hearing aid. So I think this message has to be loud and clear. Autosclerosis surgery should not be done if there is a grievous problem, an impending gusher, a stapedial artery, an abnormal facial nerve running on the stapedial plate, a, a completely obliterated round window. No. But in other cases, the so-called uh, your contraindications, only hearing ear, mixed hearing loss, should not mm -hmm. actually be an impediment to somebody giving a good hearing because today, even if this fails, you still have an option for a cochlear implant. I agree that counseling is of great importance. You need to counsel patients, you need to tell them what happens if it fails. But still, if you operate on someone and give them hearing like this for 18 years, it's still worth it, worth all the trouble. Now, this is okay. the patient. Can we have a question, please? Yes. Uh, now, there are many people who are watching you uh, who are also doing endoscopic uh, approach stapedectomy. So, yes. what is your frank opinion on endoscopic stapedectomy? You are getting me into a fix. Okay. Now, now so many people who are watching. No, 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 I, I agree, I agree. Now, I always felt that stapedic surgery is the most delicate of all surgeries. The most delicate. I'm not talking about most delicate ear surgery. I think the most delicate surgeries of all type. See, because you're looking at the two millimeter gap, a foot plate, you're making a 0.8 millimeter uh, fenestra. You're putting in a 0.6 millimeter piston that is 4.5 millimeter long. And what could get more uh, exact than that? Now, when you're doing endoscopic stepitomy, I've seen this being done. It, it, is, it is okay, it is done. But when you're doing this, there are two important limiting factors. One, you don't have two hands. Now, you can agree that you can say that you can put an endoscope, fix it onto a holder. But in the canal, if the endoscope is inside, which is what you want to need to get a panoramic view, you're actually removing off three millimeters from an eight millimeter canal, which is like you're cutting off 40% of your canal size. There is no way you can manipulate around that. For a large proportion of autosclerosis patients, you have a canal, you have a foot plate where it can take a lot of damage. It means that you can uh, make a fenestra and put in a piston like one and a half millimeter inside. Probably nothing will happen. But there is a small group of patients who will have dizziness and vertigo. There'll be a small group of patients who will have a foot plate saccule very near the foot plate. So you need, you cannot go more than that 0.4 millimeter into the vestibule. You have to be exact. It is like saying that I've been driving 30 years without a seatbelt, nothing has happened to me. That's not right. It can happen to you one day. So you're looking at, in surgery, you always look at that one little thing. 
that can go wrong and which can make that particular patient's life miserable or healthy. And that is not right. So if you are looking at, if you are going to be doing step surgery and you're going to be doing it well, you need to have two things. One, you need to have two hands. And you need to have the whole ear canal to manipulate your instrument. And you need to have excellent depth of vision. Why has God given us both eyes? For three-dimensional vision. And however good an endoscope may be, if you look at that 0.4 millimeter, 0.5 millimeter thing, no endoscope can give you that much of access. Uh, Johnny Graman here is a fantastic endoscopic surgeon, but I, I think he would completely agree with me in saying that the precision level required for stepes process going into the vestibule is beyond the capability of an endoscope. Yeah. I think it is there. So, uh, you are now being very diplomatic, bringing me into the whole picture. Actually, your clear message is that you know endoscopic stepectomy is uh, not a very uh, great thing to do. It, it makes me afraid. It no, makes me afraid. No. Yeah. So, no, no, I, I am, I'm not bringing into it, Janaki. I'm just saying that um, you, have, you can only compare a person with great skill to application in a surgery that requires big skill. Okay. Now, I can't compare somebody who's been doing endoscopic ear surgery for three years and compare to me doing stepidectomy for 28 years. It is not fair. It's not fair at all. I'm not bringing you into it for diplomacy. I'm only comparing you because I'm only comparing someone who can work around the crowd and you can, can take stuff like that. I, I'm, I'm only comparing people like that. I can't compare somebody who's a novice endoscopic surgeon and then compare him to me. It is not fair at all. Maybe I, more studies, uh, you know, uh, a single surgeon doing endoscopic versus microscopic and then maybe we, we may get an answer to this. Yeah. That, that's, that's probably the right way to do. But I still feel that, see, I, I agree that endoscopic ear surgery has got its role. I also do use endoscope and I do cholecystoma surgery. You can see into cavities that you have not seen before. You can see areas behind bone. But I still believe that endoscopic ear surgery is there to stay. It has got its role. But stepidectomy, I would be very, very, very cautious. Uh, similarly, cochlear implants, I don't think it works. Okay. Now, uh, uh, cochlear autosclerosis is something that you can pick up by these two lines. Can you see that? So if no. you have somebody with uh, a basal turn and you see a second basal turn, this is called the, the pericochlear lucency sign of cochlear autosclerosis. We went, went through this again. So when you have something like this, you can actually do a, 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 a cochlear implantation where uh, this is the bone that you are entering posterior tympanotomy and you can see how, uh, let me please it there, so this is the round window area that we have drilled. Can you see that? Now this is something that you never see in a normal cochlear implant. Never. This area is like this. It is an area where you have a blue area like you do a fenestra in a foot plate. You can see the same fenestra thing in a round window. And when you see this, you know that for sure it is cochlear autosclerosis. And when you have something like this, you need to use an electrode that has got not a completely banded. It has to be stimulating only on one side because it can easily stimulate the patient nerve and cause facial tissue. So uh, I have, uh, I am actually drilling through it, and you can see the muck inside that is widely opened. This is one condition that I will never ever try to do around window insertion. I will always do a cochlear stomy, and uh, special efforts are recommended in facial nerve stimulation is common. So, when so, we talk, uh, can we ask a few questions more? Number yes. One is that uh, you were talking about a curette being used for the bony over hand? Yes. Uh, do you recommend the use of either micro drills or um, I've seen Ashim Desai, uh, Professor Ashim Desai, using a special equipment just to you chisel. know chisel, a chisel, right? Yeah, do you recommend such uh, instruments also? No, no, no. I, I agree. See, um, uh, 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 Robert Wansan uses a chisel. Have you seen him? Yeah. I, I actually use a chisel. It's brilliant. He keeps a small chisel. He's got a small hammer and he, one hit and the, and the whole uh, overhang comes out. I probably am not very good at that. You know, I, I still think if you can use a chisel with great um, precision, it's, it's, it's actually very good. Micro drill, I wouldn't recommend. You know why I don't recommend? Because micro drill will definitely, definitely damage the product. 
the cordite tympani will be damaged if you use a micro drill because it gets caught onto there's no way you can separate the micro drill and the and the corda micro drill can be used i've seen people using it you can use a skeeter with a cutting blade you can make a you can drill out the crora uh, in the post superior overhang and use it but wherever i have seen it being done i have seen it catching the corda i have not seen it cutting the corda but i have seen it catching the corda and catching the corda means corda gets damaged you, you cannot uh, save it but if you have a, a, a chisel and you can use it well like one son does i think it it is brilliant i have seen him using it uh, it is fantastic but uh, because i have been used to uh, the curate for a very long period of time i don't want to be using the the, the chisel anymore second question is that if you have a patient with a foot plate which has gone into that is a submerged foot plate so okay. what would you do now uh, ideally like i said earlier you don't want it to happen okay now which is why all the stock was focused on how not to let it happen but i agree but if you if if it sinks into the foot into the vestibule now you must understand that uh, it is a it's a terrible thing to happen but on the good side probably nothing might go wrong probably because a sunk foot plate might just settle there it might go touch the sacule it might might cause a little bit of giddiness over time but over a period of time fibrosis happens it settles down but the worst thing can happen when it goes inside and penetrates the sacule and then it causes profound hearing loss so if you have if you are operating using a uh, using whatever instrument and a small piece of foot plate goes inside i still think don't panic because i think at that point of time uh, it would be well uh, advised to actually put a small piece of vein or a, a thin piece of fascia over the foot plate and leave it there because the foot plate actually floats upwards because there is some pressure of the endol or the perilymphatic system inside and it might get used to the fascia that you keep there uh, people have also said that you keep a drop of blood it will it will it will fix to the to the floater foot plate that you can take out but i think if you see a floater the best thing would be to leave it there it kind of uses over time and you can either leave it there and give the patient the hearing aid or go back in again and then see whether you can laser it and uh, take it and um, kind of see the carbon dioxide laser actually is very good it can actually go deeper into the water without actually damaging the causing heat inside the heat generated by co2 laser is very low they can probably dice out the foot plate that has gone inside with some risk of course but it can be done but i think if i had an issue like that i would actually seal it off and try not to do anything in that year again would you would you uh, then uh, uh, i mean i've seen surgeons doing the pots technique that is uh, trying to uh, lift that foot plate up would you recommend that no oh, no which is what i did i you saw me doing it the the case that i showed the revision case that i showed i was i actually lifted the whole foot plate out which is which is actually good so you can actually if the part of it is like you can actually take a hook and lift the whole foot plate out and make it a total step it out okay yeah please carry on okay. so uh, the results that we uh, are showing today the technology has certainly helped us to shorten the learning curve i think today if a surgeon wants to do step it out to me really well i think he can actually learn it faster than what i did because we went through this big process of uh, operating with bad microscope bad instruments and then having the skeeter and then having good good microscope then the laser i think people today might have more access if they work long enough with someone can use the newer tools and thereby shorten the learning curve which is which is a very good thing technology has to be used it, it has to be used and people don't use technology actually do stay behind there are of course people who are brilliant people there are i have seen fantastic surgeons who don't use a laser don't use a skeeter but and give fabulous results but those are artists those are people who are beyond us they are people with far greater ability than what we will ever have but not everyone is like that vast majority of us are people with good skill but not extraordinary skill but for people like us we do need technology to make us better now there is uh, also the saying which many people use is called a fool with a tool is still a fool and more powerful the tool more dangerous the fool so if you uh, have good instruments unless you are trained well you should not be using them so laser micro drills and special process have reduced much of the mistakes in step surgery if i today my patients leave surgery 2 hours late i do surgery in the morning they do 2 hours our post operative vertigo i don't remember any patient in the last many years who have had any post operative 
there have been a rare patient having postoperative vessel hearing loss delay we don't know why we know that this happens sometimes but it's been very low i think it's less than 0.5 percent it's still there which means that you still counsel for profound SNS. this is clearly said in our consent form is clearly mentioned that stapedectomy surgery can cause profound hearing loss in one person this one person is more than my actual incidence but i don't think i can be happy about that my whole of my research can be screwed up next year when i will have some few cases which will make my uh, whole statistics come back to one person so we don't worry about what happened the next four years we worry about what happens in the next five next five years so to conclude this whole talk uh, the whole everything about uh, stepitism is about precision you have to be prepared for the complete unexpected sometimes you go inside you don't find the main cus properly you find an abnormal facial nerve you find a ossified foot plate you find a big artery you find a floater in you find a possible blusher revision surgery is for the more experienced we should know which surgeries to do which surgeries it's not do i don't think that anybody should be saying that uh, don't do any step you send it to for to everyone if you are good enough if you can handle the ossicle plasty as well um, you should be able to do stepidectomy see the learning curve towards ear surgery is like this you start off by doing your temporal plastics okay and then you get better with your terminal plastic you find that your graft take up improves your patient is getting better you nothing happening you gradually move on to ossicular plastic now when you do ossicular plastic you do many things you look at the mobility of the ossicular chain you actually find out how mobile the intus is how mobile the step piece is and what the step piece foot plate mobility is once you start doing ossicular plastics on the mobile foot plate you know how much of force you can put on the foot plate on the on the step piece now you are you have to audit your own results you find that you know you do in ossicular plastics 50 of them 100 of them and none of your patients seem to be having vertigo none of them seem to be having sn hearing loss then you can uh, promote yourself to somebody who can possibly try uh, uh, a step piece surgery and when you start off with step piece surgery take out the large canals the non difficult ones ones with the not so much a mixed hearing loss relatively early cases with 35 40 db hearing loss and once you have gone through about 40 50 of them you can take the ones that have mixed hearing loss and then gradually proceed on to the ones that are more severe now uh, when you have done many hundreds of stepidectomy that is when you go for the revision stepidectomies a uh, stepidotomy which is because revisions are very very difficult even for people like me um, I, i've been operating for 20 years i think my stepid surgery i have gone to many thousands i do not i don't actually count my surgeries but um, uh, i think for me a revision is a, is in time when i am actually quite tense and you saw from my examples that revisions are never easy there are cases that i have mentioned that where you have a person who can actually have re revision of the revision that i did person who actually can, you have to operate many times to get better people who have abnormal incisors people who have uh, bleeding people who have uh, abnormal foot plate refixation so all these things are very very difficult never meant for the novice surgeon and at any point of time you should never forget the potential for hearing loss every surgery can possibly end up in profound hearing loss so when you are uh, counseling a patient with auto see this is their counseling concept um, imagine that you are a surgeon you have done 10 stepidotomies let look at this possibility so now um, somebody comes in front of you and sits down and says doc i want to do stepidotomy maybe you do it you obviously say yes i will do it and said what are the chances of my hearing loss i have gone to the internet and they have read that i have, have there is a possible hearing loss and what do you say you can say two things you can say that statistically stepidectomy has got the one percent risk of hearing loss which actually is not the untrue but it's actually untrue because you have not done so many but if you tell them that i have only done 10 he most probably will walk out and will never see him again so how do you how do you manage this you say that see listen i have done a few and um, and i have done i am i am quite i have i have done some good surgeries but you must never forget that there is always a potential for hearing loss and if there is a hearing loss i will know what to do you don't have to tell him that i will be referring him to x y z but you can also say i know what to do and today in this day even if you develop a profound hearing loss there is always technology to revert your hearing back to normal See, I always thought that patients actually are not so much worried about complications. They are worried about what you actually are going to do with the complication. If you say that I can cause a hearing loss and after that I don't know what to do, 
that is what is most worrying for them you do a, if somebody asks me like if i do a thyroid surgery what will happen to my vocal cords i say that i mean technically speaking i can save your retinal and nerve all the time but if at all it does i know what to do to improve your voice if your retinal nerve gets damaged and that is what they want to hear so whenever you are counseling patients for first step surgery tell them that honestly never lie tell them that there is a possibility for hearing loss but if there is hearing loss we can always there are always technologies available to improve the hearing loss so which is something that we need to do so um, i hope janaki that i have done uh, enough in you know uh, thank you so uh, much dr manoj uh, i think it was extremely good a fantastic lecture um, uh, basically uh, you have conveyed everything through the lecture i don't want to praise you much you don't like praises i know that so uh being very academic uh, let me uh, congratulate you on your excellent work on stepy surgery and i hope the audience we have, we have actually to tell you some statistics we have actually got a huge number of audience who have uh, seen you from all over the world can you stop the screen share please can you yeah. stop the screen screen share yeah, yeah. Uh, we, have, we have had a huge number of people who have watched you from all over the world like uh, uh, for, uh, to just to name some countries uh, south africa and then uh, we've had a uh, lot of middle east uh, countries mexico canada uh, uh, america and then this side indonesia and uh, i have the names of all those i'll give you the exact statistics of how many people saw you maybe uh, maybe more than 3000 or 4000 people so actually these programs are done uh, purely on the basis of academics and i hope that uh, 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 the people who have seen it would have massively benefited from your past experience on stepy surgery so uh, thank you very much dr manoj and just to remind the audience that we have one more uh, uh, the uh, just want to sh- uh, tell that you know this is actually a dedication to uh, the uh, the professor professor stamberger who uh, passed away uh, we really uh, are in deep sorrow uh, to know that he was the greatest gentleman ever and uh, who propagated the concept of endoscopic sinus surgery uh, and a really uh, a heartfelt uh, you know uh, condolences to his family uh, and also want to uh, tell you that 5th january we have a program just dedicated to professor stamberger i will try to bring in a lot of people uh, i'm going to talk with professor sethi tomorrow who have all moved in close contact with uh, professor stamberger and i want to do a program just to dedicate it to him and also we have one program on implantable hearing devices by professor Ma- mohan kamishwaran i uh, have given a provisional date of january 19 so uh, thank you alambic uh, i know you are very 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 academic and uh, thank you dr manoj and uh, thank you uh, all for uh, being with us have a good night and uh, god bless you all thank you so much thank you I, i would never have done it without you and thanks again alambic thank you so much i hope it went off without any major hazards absolutely fantastic fantastic so i just want to congratulate you on two things of course i should, again i have to tell you because one thing is your follow the the kind of uh, records which you have maintained uh, this is actually one thing which all the juniors should uh, actually see how meticulous he has been on his uh, uh, audiogram charts uh, or over the years so that is one point very important carrying on point and number two is his clarity of thought and his quality of surgery so uh, i think these are the two most important carry home uh, messages uh, very crystal clear images uh, no uh, ambiguity and uh, well, very 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 nicely done uh, dr manoj a big uh, congratulations to you thank you thank you so much jan uh, thank you so much really appreciate it. thank you bye 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 good night Oh, thank you.